Thank you, everyone. We hope you had a good lunch and had some like, delicious food and sweets and some coffee. Um, we're starting off our second panel for the day um, with four speakers. Um, the discussant for this panel is Professor Tan Katrina Bang, Professor of History. So important and convincing as this thesis is, 
it unwittingly may be occluding from view pre 19th century coastal traditions and centers of Islamic manuscript production and writing in Arabic that operated outside of Lago and Zanzibar. Such centers may have been legatees of earlier waves of Islamic knowledge production in the Arabic writing on the coast, traces of which are found on the coast's inscribed material culture. This paper proposes that a hitherto little known and understudied corpus of illuminated Quran manuscripts produced between 1750 and 1850 was made in one of these centers of Islamic scholarship and manuscript production, that of Fati Island. Furthermore, the corpus's content and materiality reflect a local and distinctive coastal African Muslim tradition which drew inspiration from the region's inscribed material culture. This tradition thrived in the midst of a dynamic and cosmopolitan island society that was connected to people and places in coastal East Africa and the Indian Ocean, literal. The paper is divided into two parts. The first part provides a quick survey of inscribed objects on the coast. The second part introduces the Quran corpus and explores its material, transmedial, physical, and digital mobilities. The concluding remarks consider how we might begin to situate Fata Island's distinctive manuscript tradition within the histories of Islamic scholarship on the Africa's Swahili coast and the Indian Ocean. Studies of writing on the coast material culture are few. Scholarly fields that have attempted to, to attend to aspects of this subject include archaeology, material culture, art history, and manuscript studies. Archaeology has provided chronologies of many coastal sites and historical analyses of their material remains. Yet a comprehensive study of the range and types of epigraphy and writing on the coastal sites remains to be produced. Material culture art historical studies have documented coastal objects with writing, but the first ever survey of inscribed material culture was only produced in 2018. Scholars working on Arabic and Swahili manuscripts have also noted the importance of a variety of writing on material culture, but have focused on manuscripts. However, when reviewing this range of scholarship, it becomes plain that from the 8th to the 19th century, Writing on the coast is everywhere. Examples include coins, luxury and ceremonial objects, mosque architecture, tombstones and funerary architecture, wooden doors, ceramics, textiles and mats, handwritten texts including dedicatory notes, letters, transcript documents and books on paper, and other objects such as wooden sandals, as well as Arabic grammar books and religious texts. I apologize for the quick survey, but I just didn't have time to go through each of those um, examples this morning. But I wanted to share with you an idea. The historical scope and breadth of objects and types of objects and material surfaces which contain writing suggest that what is often referred to as the Swahili coast may be regarded as the calligraphic coast. Literally in terms of the diversity of writing found on different surfaces over the long period. Metonymically, in terms of what such inscriptions imply in terms of the diversity of knowledge production and circulation. And metaphorically, in terms of offering a contrasting paradigm to the pathological term in scholarship, wherein the particular it often becomes subsumed by oceanic flows and rotating currents. So with the introduction of this complementary paradigm and gentle propagation, I turn to the second part of the paper, which begins by introducing the manuscript corpus. Thus far in my ongoing research, I have identified 15 manuscripts consisting 13 different Qur'ans, most of which are two volumes. Two manuscripts are in Kenya, one in Tanzania, four in Oman, two in the UK, and two are in the United States. And the whereabouts of four others are unknown. A number of other manuscripts are known to exist, including those currently housed at the Law Court Museum, and others that are with local families on Pate Island. I have estimated that there may be some two dozen surviving manuscripts in the world today. 
Now, the manuscripts in this corpus share many features, including their materials, such as paper, inks, and leather bindings, as well as script styles, as well as many decorative features. They are all produced in a vertical format, between around 30 to 25 centimeters, and each of them has between 300 and 400 folios. In addition to the Quranic text, the manuscripts include call poems, endowment inscriptions, ownership notations, supplementary sections containing prayers and annotations that include variant readings and other types of commentary. All the text is Arabic. While a detailed study of the annotations awaits to be carried out, preliminary study shows that the references are from canonical Sunni scholars and sources. The manuscripts were produced between 1750 and 1850 on Pate Island in the city-states of Pate, Siu, and Faso. The dating is based on watermarks and countermarks, as well as providence records and internal evidence of endowment inscriptions, signatures, and chronicles, which also provide production locations. So here on the screen, we'll see two such examples. On the left is a, is a Quran currently housed in the Royal Asiatic Society, and it was produced by Al Siwi, and uh, that is the um, uh, um, endonym for Siu, which is on Pater Island. And then on the right, we have a polypho, which clearly states um, that the scribe, uh, Qadi Abdul Karim and uh, Qadi Umar al uh, says in the polypho itself that he is, by residence, uh, a, a person living in Faza and that he was the salary imam of the Friday mosque there. And it also has a date which corresponds to uh, Friday 28th June 1829. So the corpus um, was produced in the era that has been called the Swahili Renaissance, which began with the ousting of the post Portuguese from the coast in 1729 and ended with the establishment of the Sultan of Zanzibar as well as the arrival of European powers. In this era, Pate was the island's largest city state and the most important maritime port in the archipelago. Its rulers, the Dabhani dynasty, built upon mainland connections with eastern Africa and maritime connections around the Indian Ocean littoral, particularly Gujarat, to usher in a period of economic growth and cultural efflorescence. Ivory and textiles were amongst the prized commodities that transited through Pate's harbor alongside slaves, migrants, and travelers from various parts of Africa and the Western Indian Ocean. In 1800, Pate was a walled city of some 30 hectares that housed a population of 10 to 11,000 people and had at least 10 mosques. The city saw a new literary production in Arabic and Swahili for architectural embellishment and the arrival of many imported goods. Pate's population was diverse. It comprised Muslims and non-Muslims, indigenous groups of different ethnic backgrounds, mainland migrants, as well as people from other parts of the Swahili coast, Eastern Africa and the Western Indian Oceans, including Arabia and India. Pate's neighbors, the city-states of Siu and Faza, also thrived. By 1800, Siu, an agrarian settlement, had an estimated population of some 20,000 and may have had some 5,000 stone houses in at least eight mosques. <clears throat> the reign of Siu's sadly ruler, Wanamataka, nurtured a renaissance of new ideas, fashions, and opinions, and a new spirit of inquiry, as well as the growth of craft industries and manuscript production. By 1800, Faso also had a sizable population of some 10,000 and had at least three months. It had a large Bajuni population whose origins lay in southern Somalia. Like the majority of the coast Swahili Muslims, the Bajunis were Sunni Shafis, and later tradition recalls them as having a cadre of astute scholars who produced Qurans in an attractive script on high quality paper. Like other Muslim scholars of the coast, those on Pate Island were part of an interconnected community whose members studied with a variety of local and visiting scholars from different madhabs and Sufi orders, spoke different and multiple languages, including Arabic and local variants of Swahili, and came from different ethnic backgrounds. Pata Island's corpus of illuminated Qurans was produced in this dynamic era and cosmopolitan milieu. So we're going to now look at word material mobility. Based on a preliminary study, the manuscript's paper is of European origin 
and some of it was produced by northern Italian paper manufacturers who began their operations in the 1700s and shipped paper to Africa and the Middle East by Egypt and Sudan. European paper was widely used for Islamic manuscript production, but how Italian-made paper reached coastal East Africa is not known. However, the known history of European paper exports and circulations in Africa, Fatih's connections to Eastern Africa and the Indian Ocean, and the advent of the Swahili Renaissance may explain the conduits and conditions that have occasioned the arrival of such paper on the coast. Now, what is really curious is that despite Pate's trade connections, there is no evidence as yet that he had imported or off manuscripts. Rather, the island scholars seem to have chosen to produce their own manuscripts on imported paper. In terms of motivation, it may be worth recalling that the copying of the Quran is regarded as a pious act. Indeed, one of the scribes tells us in his colloquy that he undertook to copy the Musaf for himself, Mokat Katabal Yaksi. Possibly aiming to gain God's blessings. Piety and the desire for God's favor, which is associated with writing God's word, may have also extended to making Quran manuscripts, a number of which were endowed to local mosques in perpetuity. As suggested by the art historian Margaret Graves, making is not solely a bodily act, but a process in which intellectual, sensory, and mental faculties become profoundly intertwined. My preliminary protocolical analysis of the manuscripts paper in the bindings indicates that they were made by skilled cadre of producers who knew how to calculate the quantity and size of paper required for a single volume or set of volumes, size and trim the pages, impress paper with rule lines, prepare medium or appropriate inks, create and deploy compounds to fix the inks, and prepare the completed sheets for binding. But how the coast manuscripts producer learned, transmitted, and honed these knowledges is still unknown. Swahili poetry from the period suggests that there was knowledge of manuscript production in the region. A poem by a scholar in post Tanzania writes of a board, Ibao, and cords required to make a ruling frame, Masakari, that would impress rule lines on paper to aid the copies writing. Many of the corpus of manuscripts show line impressions that indicate the use of such a movement frame, a tool that was used throughout the Islamic world. And you can see on the screen here, I've provided a, an image of one such kind of ruling frame. And you can see on the manuscript page that the lines show the impressions that the ruling frame made. Likewise, a number of manuscript leather covers show blind stamping in which decorative metal pieces are impressed on the surface to create an embossed pattern. Tools and techniques also used in many other Muslim contexts. These and other protocological examples are thus traces of the tacit expert knowledge and skills that circulated amongst Pakistan Island's manuscript producers. All of this strongly suggests that Pakistan Island was an established center of Islamic manuscript production, a proposition which is supported by Howard Brown's ethnographic study of the town of Siu during the 1980s in which he established that the city-state was locally known to be a regional hub of Swahili crafts and manuscript production from 1750 to 1850. The second kind of media mobility I'm going to discuss is transmedia mobility. <clears throat> so this aspect of mobility is the resonance between the corpus's features and other forms of material culture in the region and its contact zones. There are numerous examples of this kind of transmediation or interchange. For example, decorations of scrolling, floral, and white motifs found on the manuscript's frontispieces and surah titles are almost identical to stucco decorations on wall niches and door surrounds of the coast 19th century houses. Another example is the correspondence between the so-called Solomon's knots found on at least two frontispieces and objects such as a tombstone found on Vasa Island dated to 1462, the 15th and 16th century copper alloy sideboard blown forward from London, and a 18th, 19th century mahogany door frame from sea. In terms of script, many of the manuscripts have surah titles and other texts placed in cartouches. Often rendered in reserved white or black or red, the script with its stacked or overlapping letters has an epigraphic appearance that resembles inscriptions on the region's stone tombstones. 
These and other examples of transmediation suggest the fact that manuscripts, copyists, and artists were working within an existing aesthetic tradition or were working toward establishing what I might call, what I'm calling kind of a local brand. I should note that you know here that strategic rebranding appears to have been part of Pate's craft and culture. Jeremy Prestwell's work recalls that in the 16th century, Pate's textile industry was founding on unraveling the threads of silk cloth imported from India and China and reweaving it into cloth styles that were favored by African consumers. There are, of course, correspondences with Qurans produced in other parts of Africa and around the Indian Ocean. Some examples include the use of extended commentary on verses inside the main text frame. There is one instance in the corpus, but this occurs frequently in Qurans of Harar. Then there's the Nazi-like script used throughout the corpus, which resonates in some ways to Qurans in Bihar script produced in India's death. Particularly in terms of sharp, in the sharp drops of the moon, the swooping tails of the beam and some other letter forms, and the rumination of the word Allah. There is some correspondence with decorations found on Chinese export wares, and the corpus's frontispieces resemble those found on Quran's from Southeast Asia. But despite such echoes, the consistency within the corpus and its resonances with local material culture is remarkable. As such, the corpus's content and aesthetics may exemplify the way in which Pate Island's Islamic scholars and manuscript producers marked out or produced their distinctiveness within their cosmopolitan context or within the cosmopolis of the Indian Ocean. The final types of mobility I want to consider are the manuscript's physical dispersal and digitization. As noted, many of the manuscripts became dispersed. This was likely triggered in the early 1800s when Pate fell to the Sultanate of Time trade was diverted to Lama. By the late 1800s, Siu and Faza were also subjugated to Zanzibar, along with the last of a high stronghold on the mainland at Wiji. In the 1900s, Bata Island became depopulated and poor owing to migration, disease, dwindling economic opportunities, and the general political marginalization of the coast. These factors, along with the region's humidity and salty air, were not favorable to the island's material culture, particularly manuscripts. While some manuscripts remain on the island, others found their way to private public collections in other parts of East Africa, Britain, the USA, and Oman. The physical journeys of some of the manuscripts are fascinating, and I'm showing two examples here. And these speak to the ways in which such portable texts got decontextualized, misidentified, recontextualized, and ended up with new identities. In recent years, the effects of these dispersals are being counterbalanced by manuscript digitization projects, including those led by Professor Anban with the British Library, and other projects being undertaken in the Sultanate of Oman. Indeed, it was only through these projects that I was able to reunite, at least virtually, three dispersed volumes of the four-part Quran produced in Faza, two volumes of which were located in two different collections in Oman, and a third volume that was located in a private collection in Tanzania. Now, such digital circuits that move through the virtual world at lightning speed provide many research opportunities. But they cannot always stand in for physical engagements nor allow us to appreciate the labor these manuscripts perform for present-day communities. And this may be particularly true of Qurans, which are regarded by Muslims as God's work. In fact, I was reminded of this when, I, when in the course of my research, I came across an Instagram post by Samia Mufwana. Here, maybe Samia posts an image of a Quran manuscript, likely part of the corpus, warmly embraced by CU's residents. She writes, that's a 600-year-old Quran, written by locals from CU Island on Pate Island. CU village on Pate Island, may Allah bless and protect the family who has preserved it for this long. I feel honored to have such a rich Islamic history in my homeland. So, previous Samia's some comments lead me to some concluding thoughts on the question of how we might situate the corpus of the histories of Arabic writing and Islamic scholarship on the Swahili coast and in the Indian Ocean. 
The corpus adds to the growing body of Arabic manuscripts from post East Africa and evidences the presence of pre 19th century, century tradition that developed independently from Zanzibar Lago in the context of a burgeoning Indian Ocean economy and cosmopolitan culture. Its content suggests that Islamic scholars and Muslim craftspeople of Fatih Island carefully created a local Swahili Muslim brand that visually defined their island culture. The brand, while having some Eastern African and Indian Ocean echoes, primarily resonated with the region's rich material culture and formed a powerful visual assemblage. Indeed, so powerful was Fatih's brand and the qualities that nurtured it that the Sultanate of Zanzibar set out to subjugate and ultimately dismantle it. Thus, as scholarship moves toward thinking about the ways in which the people of Africa's islands and coasts engage with the Indian Ocean, it should also recall the rail politic under which these engagements played out and how local coastal African Muslim communities developed their place in the context of interregional connectivity. Finally, from a historiographical perspective, as the new mythology sets out to tackle land-based readings in coastal Africa's history, a counter-paradigm such as the calligraphic coast may be required to keep its ambitions in check. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sufiko. Our next presentation is titled Enslaved East African Intellectuals, the Occult and the Environment Across the Western Indian Ocean. This is presented by uh, Ahmed Al Azmi, PhD candidate at Princeton University. Thank you very much. Uh, the local uh, 
Jesus and the bodies of Lenin we mentioned and without what the white haired sheikh said. So it must be either that he, the slave, did not reveal their secret or that they did not know this formula at all. Or what he said is true and it is possible to do what they said in an easier way. All of this can be true in many ways of assessment. And my slave was not with me when I wrote this book. If Allah Almighty wants me to meet him, the slave, I will ask him about this formula and write it. This is part of my dissertation project in which I try to think about what role did enslave these Africans play in the emergence, uh, in the emergence and transmission of uh, the occult sciences and environmental knowledge between Oman and East Africa. Following the retreat of the Portuguese Empire from Eastern Arabia and its white coast in the mid-17th century, Omani planters and peasants increasingly migrated to East Africa. They joined relatives or made new homes in the expanding Omani transoceanic agrarian economy. This movement across thousands of miles to the southern hemisphere enabled new opportunities for learning. And coming from a predominantly Arabic ecology, the transoceanic crossing introduced them to alien flora and fauna, and they newly encountered East African monsoon red forests and farmlands. Since the early modern period, the ensuing environmental conceptualization experiences and affective interactions resulted not only in the transportation of environmental infrastructures, but also to the emergence of epistemologies and new forms of knowledge. The minds interacted with these African literal and interior populations across various intellectual domains. These venues of learning intertwined both Omani and Swahili occult sciences that were implanted in the soil of East Africa. Several Omani jurists and polymaths observed and learned from their surroundings and East African informants. They produced textual instruments in the form of grimoires, manuals of occult sciences, and botanical treatises. These instruments employed both Omani epistemic technology and locally rooted East African idioms and experiential modes of knowing and being. This transcultural convergence nourished the emergence of an epistemic field that provides a generative archive of environmental history, the intellectual history of enslaved East Africans and non European oceanic empires. In this paper, I draw on the works of Nasser bin Jaid al Sharusi, known as Nasser bin Amin al Khan, who lived between 1778 and 1847. He's an Omani jurist and occultist who lived between Oman and East Africa. And I consider him to be a collective repository of environmental knowledge. This paper is a micro history of a revealing moment in which we get a rare glimpse of enslaved East Africans who acted as intellectuals disseminating valuable alchemical and environmental knowledge. Further, I trace how the occult practitioners sought ontological change and material control in the natural world. Building on the intersection of science and environmental history, I examine, among other fields, the environmental meaning of the occult, in which the human and non-human interact and come together. My analysis sheds light on the way in which ethnobotanical, aquatic, and agrarian knowledge operated and circulated between the Arabian and African coasts, animated in occultist idioms written in Arabic and Swahili languages. Moreover, I describe in detail the process through which multilingual occultist works were theorized and experienced by literate and illiterate East African and Omani actors, while also addressing the interlinkages between power dynamics and knowledge hierarchies. This paper explores uncharted waters in a transoceanic world by tracing processes of translation, the formation of knowledge networks, and the environmental engagements that animated them. It's an attempt to write a connected environmental history told through overworked Omani and enslaved East African intellectuals and their textual production. As you can see here, Nasser is calling you, the readers, to go to Zanzibar and to experience the, the spiritual properties of Zanzibari plants. And he says, my slave was not with me when I wrote this book. So here I think about East African intellectuals and the knowledge cartography of the Saidi Empire. In the narrow green valley of Al-Aliya village in Wadi Bani Kharus in northern Oman, 
Terraces were carved out of the Rawabi Mountains to cultivate palm groves and wheat to provide a living for its population. The emerging, the emerging Al Musaidi dynasty at this time, founded by Imam Ahmed bin Said, ruled this agrarian region in the second half of the 18th century. During the reign of the first Musaidi Sultan, Nasr bin Amin Khan grew up in a scholarly milieu as his father, Amin Khan, was one of the leading jurists and occultists also of his time. He was known, uh, known as the Sheikh Raiz, meaning the head scholar, a unique title that no one uh, held in Oman ever or since. Uh, Nasser's career was multifaceted. He, his upbringing and curiosity motivated him to pursue his education beyond the familiar juridical fields. According to the contemporaneous chronicle of the Mosaic, Nasser was a prominent figure among the Omani literati, known for being a philanthropist carrying an ascetic life and following a Sufi lifestyle. Nasser in Oman, uh, in Omani collective memory, is known for performing many supernatural wonders. And he was, according to the Rosaire, creative in all sciences and prolific. He loved alchemy, meaning alchemy and its techniques. Perhaps he knew it successfully, according to most opinions, as of the Rosaire uh, stated. And although Nasser lived in a lower area, the capital of the Busaidis, until 1792, Rostov was only a few hours' walk north of his village. And this proximity to the most important political center of his time enabled him to interact with different scholars specialized in various fields. The result is exhibited through his prolific production in a range of different tracks on theology, medicine, astronomy, and jurisprudence. After living and experiencing firsthand the East African cultural and environmental trains in the first half of the 19th century, Nasser wrote uh, a book called al sur Ali Ibn Khawas and Nabat al Sawahi the supreme secret on the properties of Swahili plants. This book, written in the genre of Ibn Sir, as Omanis called call sciences, and Swahilis as Siri, represents a deep engagement with the flora and fauna of not only the Swahili archipelago, but also the East African mainland. Coming from an agrarian background, Nasser was attuned to the ways in which the locals attract, uh, were attracting with their trees, shrubs, animals in the ocean. His writings make clear, though, that he had some assistance along the way. The unnamed enslaved man in Nasser's account of a formula to produce light lived during a time of profound historical uh, changes on the main island of Zanzibar, Mbuya, during the first half of the 19th century. The appearance of this anonymous enslaved illuminator, as I call him, is emblematic of a wider historical phenomena in which we find the enslaved acting as co-creators of a valued body of knowledge about the natural world and its supernatural properties. And tracing their shadowy presence on the pages of Omani and Swahili manuscripts, we might begin to think about the voices that historians have privileged in the intellectual histories of the Indian Ocean world and the forms of knowledge that their negligence occludes. The slave intellectuals, like the illuminator, are yet to be written in the histories of slavery, as well as the historical implications of thinking about slavery, not only on the plantations of Zanzibar, but also on the, on, in the other overlooked domains in which East African intellectual labor has gone unnoticed. The occult sciences on the Swahili coast have a long history that predates the arrival of Omani empires. They have flourished since the 17th century, at least as far south as Madagascar, where a substantial body of Malagasy texts written in the Saurabi, uh, Arabic Malagasy Ajami script circulated, which you can find on most in the university website. The enslaved companion of Nasser in the Omani interior introduced him to the East African occult practices before he settled in Zanzibar. Nasser's introduction to different forms and systems of experiencing the natural and the natural and supernatural world expanded his intellectual horizons and ignited a desire to learn further about them beyond what was available to him in Omani sources. The unnamed enslaved illuminator had passed through many hands and lives uh, from enslavement up to the point of educating Nasser about the methods of producing light. 
And because it passage, we learn that someone else, as he calls a pious man, was the enslaver of the illuminator before Nasser. The illuminator possessed remarkable skills in carving statues that caused an icon iconoclastic uproar against what is considered quintessentially paganistic by creating idols. We do not know the religious or cultural significance of his creation. However, the objection might have been linked to his expertise in the occult sciences. We might think of Nasser cited enslaved men from the East African islands and mainland as public intellectuals, since they have possessed valued knowledge, surpassing most of the voiceless and cited enslaved people in the social hierarchy of Oman and East Africa. However, historians should not romanticize their role and perception, as the dynamics of power and its trans and transfer between enslaved individuals and their enslavers would have rendered these enslaved East African public intellectuals unequal to other freeborn and native intellectuals. The abject blood experiences of enslaved intellectuals should be the more reason to pause and appreciate the rare appearances they are allowed on the pages of occultists and jurists and foreground their forgotten contributions to the circuits of knowledge uh, production in the Indian Ocean world. In his preface, the historian Matthew Homer, who we have here, uh, lamented the gaps, absences, and silences around slave trade between East Africa and South Arabia. He remarks, uh, his remarks are indicative of the state of the historiography about the role of slavery in the Omani empires. He writes, and I quote you, I hope that Arabic manuscripts will reveal the inner workings of the slave trade and allow me to draw the kinds of concrete conclusions made by historians of the transatlantic slave trade and provide an annual social framework for understanding this rich history. In my work, I attempt to contribute to this deafening silence by showcasing the potential of Omani's widely manuscripts as sources that can shed light on the lives of enslaved East Africans beyond their established representation as merely laborers. Against the expected narrative, I foreground their intellectual contributions and their remarkable role in transmitting new ideas and forms of learned practices between East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. The history of slavery in the Indian uh, Ocean world is yet to be recognized in the broader intersection between environmental engagements and cosmological perceptions. Unlike the Christian missionaries which turned up in East Africa during the 19th century, and I quote, condemned African spiritual use of the forest, as environmental historians of East Africa has, uh, have established, Omanis, on the other hand, have documented, translated, and disseminated East African indigenous occult knowledge. Contrary to the dominant narrative in the historiography, there is no historical evidence that Islam, as practiced by Omanis and Swahilis, have displaced East African spiritual traditions. A closer look at the text of Nasser bin Amin al Han reinforced the evidence that East African occult knowledge was valued as a legitimate occult scientific source to understand and uh, to manipulate the environment. Reading the history of the Musaili expansion beyond being a merely maritime empire, as the received wisdom would like us to believe, is to trace its expansion in the various ways in which connectivity between Oman and East Africa intensified by the turn of the 19th century, and how it resulted, as it was the case with the Portuguese area, in gleaning knowledge from local spaces, which shaped them into the logic of empire. Unlike the Portuguese Empire, however, the Empire of the Saidis, despite its expansionist outlook, was not an empire with an ideological civilizational mission that sought to project a hierarchical uh, ethnological schema on its sub uh, subjugated overseas territories. The tribe sought to exploit the heterogeneity of its subjects from southeastern Arabia, southern Balochistan, Kutch, Gujarat, and East Africa by employing them in its armies, bureaucracy, financial administration, legal system, and later in its emerging plantation economy. The heterogeneity of its cultural composition can be seen in the development of occult sciences as an enterprise that benefited from the transoceanic encounters between Asia and Africa. My explanation here is not only plausible but historically necessary to allow these marginalized historical actors to claim their limited historical roles in fields as actors who participated 
and the production of history or any of the sites where the production may occur, as Rodolfo Chorillo said. Moving beyond thinking of the Omani empires and Swahili societies as merely like a child can allow us to see other unwritten dimensions of this historical experience. By overlooking themes such as the weird and the strange represented by the occult sciences, as well as the instead intellectuals, the production of history will be skewed toward relegating the enslaved to an abject role as laborers while absenting their intellectual contributions, their valued uh, ideas about the environment and their occult practices. Moreover, the nature of the Omani Swahili occult manuscripts offer historians a challenge to rethink the current framework of writing in Indian history, seen through the, the lens of ubiquitous yet unnamed historical actors. Reading the works of Nasser Ben Abin Abhan as micro histories on an oceanic scale enable us to see what the historian Nandini Chatterjee called breadcrumbs, trails. Building on the framework of the historian Carl Ginsburg, who, as I quote her, who suggests that microhistory is a method of following seemingly insignificant clues that in reality offer the truest picture. Chatterjee uh, emphasized that all historians follow clues, follow, uh, follow, following breadcrumb trails, is part and parcel of a profession in which most of us write about and try to understand. People who we cannot talk to who cannot talk to us and explain why they did what they did. Thus, in my work, uh, we follow the everyday agrarian lives of communities around the Indian Ocean, in which many cosmologists and epistemologies and ontologies spoke to each other. Far from being a cosmopolitan arena of interaction among the leads, the world of jurists, planters, sultans, and merchants were not separate from the peasants, mariners, and the enslaved. People from desperate socioeconomic backgrounds have contributed to the formation of occult sciences and other intellectual genres. This methodology and way of knowing the natural processes of the environment animated both the intellectual scenes of the Arabian Peninsula and East Africa. The knowledge of East African enslaved intellectuals in Arabia and Omani peasants on the Swahili coast both forged the convergence of seemingly different ecological and climatic zones to learn about the flora and fauna of these regions that are thousands of miles away from each other, yet profoundly interlinked through mobile and, in, and immobile actors. There are many stones unturned in the Swahili Omani occult terrains that need further analysis not entertained in my project. There are many more unexamined intellectual projects that employ the occult sciences to ask environmental questions and pursue their answers in both Oman and East Africa. In addition to occult sciences, Many of the works were written by legal thinkers and jurists who have straddled these two fields of law and the occult, fields that are ought to speak to each other in environmental history, the history of slavery, and empire in the Indian Ocean world. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
In one of them, I was speaking with a woman in her mid-30s, let's call her Maria, who had been invited along by a Zanzibar Omani family I had been set up to meet by a Zanzibar friend from the UK. Over the last years, more people I met came to know that I was particularly interested in speaking with second and third generation or post-Iasporan Swahili speakers in Oman, learning about their own understandings of belonging somewhere on a Swahili diasporic spectrum. And I was lucky often enough that people in my network frequently helped me make such connections. Maria told me as we sat chatting in her living room after the first visit was done, that even though she was raised speaking Swahili, she considered herself pure Omani, referred to herself as Mshashi and not as Zanzibari. Her father had made sure that her Arabic was accent free so she would be better able to avoid potential bullying at school. But what she emphasized most was that she was happy that she grew up with Swahili because otherwise she would not have had any way of speaking with her maternal grandmother in Kemba, the small island of the FM Zanzibar. Her knowing Swahili was the only way that allowed them to converse. As she summarized, Swahili is my grandmother tongue. In the other chat I had, I was speaking with a woman in her early twenties, as Kole Sahela. I've known Sahela for years, again through Zanzibar Connections, and we regularly hang out when I'm in Muscat. Sahela acknowledges her family heritage as in Zanzibar, but when moving around in public, um, she commonly doesn't like to speak Swahili because of the derogatory remarks she has previously encountered as a reaction. But what stayed with me equally, what, um, about, uh, what she explained was that growing up speaking both Swahili and Arabic, it were writing and reading that had now become difficult for her. And this was actually the moment that I realized why she never replied to my written WhatsApp messages in writing, but always sent voice messages in return. To read or reply to written messages I, in Swahili, I usually need someone who helps me understand, she explained. So as an anthropologist, these two conversations, Mariam's framing of Swahili as my grandmother tongue, and Sahaila's description of the loss of Swahili literacy, particularly sparked my attention because they illustrate a dynamic process that may be a helpful point of departure when the broader aim is to think about the thing we commonly speak of as the Indian Ocean otherwise, and in order to push ourselves to ask questions of this sea that simultaneously dismantle the underlying ideologies and unconscious bias that in the first place continue to make us think amid the confines of certain a well-established observation, as scholars like Ray Mustafa Sharaf have made this very clear, is that forced migration has affected the identity of, as she calls them, Swahili-speaking communities of memory in the sorts of the man. Now, in my own research over the previous years, I have become especially interested in how we can think with the younger Omani Swahili-speaking communities of memory beyond these influences of the past, and to take seriously as well what matters to second and third generation Zanzibari Omanis. What matters to those who never returned or arrived themselves, but who were born into the cultural multiplicity of this Swahili Sea, as Ivan and Yang War calls it, in the process of negotiating their sense of belonging in the land today. And one of these aspects, and I propose this with this talk, being the ongoing valuation of Swahili as a kid-making tool that is simultaneously accompanied by a loss of language and literacy. So with this talk, and by turning to feminist Indian Ocean Studies, linguistic anthropology and the arts for orientation, I want to ask, how can we think about the Indian Ocean in a way that is more attuned to contemporary conversations on the, con uh, conversations on the conservation of intangible heritages, such as preventing the dissolution of dialogue across the Indian Ocean world. And argue that the notion of grandmother tongue, as proposed by Maria, may serve as a generative analytic device that can help us think more practice oriented and intersectionally about Swahili Indian Ocean intangible heritage in the Gulf and with, with the multiplicity of the Indian Ocean less as place and as method, as has been proposed by the Hopmar and Dirk and others, and most recently been emphasized again specifically in regard to the languages of the Indian Ocean by now. So, skip this. Um, no, 
contract in order to help you contextualize my general interest in this and where I'm coming from. So as a political anthropologist, I'm interested in concepts and processes that can help make the political or in the broadest sense what makes people want to make some other people do something visible. And Audra Simpson's notion of refusal, Carol McGranahan's concept of witnessing, or Tanya Lee's idea of interruptions are a range of examples that allow us to do just that. Now, in my own ethnographic work on the politics of childhood, which has largely taken place in Zanzibar for the last 10 years, um, protection and its associated notions of prevention, preservation, conservation, and care emerged as, a relevant, um, as relevant from this ethnography. And in Swahili, this is best represented by the verb kuhifadi that describes roughly putting something in a state or place of safety. Now, of course, and specifically so in anthropology, there is a need to be wary of saving discourses and actions, especially when they appear in a sympathetic form, as Cromer recently put it in a recollection of Lila Bouloukhod's famous work on whether Muslim women need saving. Where I propose an ethnographic discourse of protecting, preserving, and safeguarding may hold different potential, and especially so in regard to critical Swahili Indian Ocean studies is by shifting the focus to what it is that people themselves, not researchers, want to take care of or already put in a state or place of safety and what safeguarding practices people are realizing or managing um, in order to better assure the transmission of intangible heritages such as Swahili. In Oman, the signs of Swahili are plenty, and particularly in the form of food and the significance of a Swahili presence. And in these images in Muscat, um, you can see some of those. Um, yeah, they are particularly recognizable. But beyond this culinary and potentially least publicly politicized realm, some of the most noticeable public calls that emphasize the observation that Swahili is both alive and valued in Oman as a grandmother tongue, but that its uh, literacy is also on the decline and accompanied by regret, include the following. Firstly, Zanzibar British Nobel Prize winner Abdul Raza Gurna's claim from 2015 that despite the remarkable fact that Kiswahili, literally the language of the coast, continued to spread across the Indian Ocean even after many of the century-old trade relations came to an end with the political event of the Zanzibar Revolution in the 1960s, he asserts that it is today not only the most widely spoken African language, but, and which according to him is more or less seldom known, is also spoken as a first language across the ocean in Oman and the Gulf cities, where whole districts are enclaves of people from the ocean's western shores. Gurna, like many of the Swahili speakers or no longer Swahili speakers who speak to me in Oman, also laments that the loss and dissolution of the centuries of dialogue that had linked these territories, which he and they observe, are underway with a limited attention to and valuation of Swahili in this region in terms of preservation. Then there is Omani scholar um, Said Ajadami, who echoes the potential loss and dissolution Grana describes and conceptualizes Swahili as a minority language at risk of extinction in Oman and as one of the eight endangered languages in the Sultanate that should be kept alive. And thirdly, framing such as those by Zanzibar Omani professor Nafla Harusi, who reflects on the implications of language choice among Omani Swahili speakers for contemporary conceptions of identity and belonging in three groups of speakers today make this further clear. Those who willingly speak the language in public and private domains, those who speak it in private domains only, and those who refuse to speak the language no matter what the context and often pretend not to know it when spoken to. So these help thinking about the state of Swahili in Oman in its multiplicity. In all these framings, a need for preservation, protection, or refusal to loss of language and the dissolution of the ability to speak with each other is implicated. And I believe this discourse 
in, in this discourse deserves scholarly attention by responding to it by way of zooming in on the interruptions to and the refusal of this loss um, by way of protection. Now this need for a focus on questions of protection, preservation, conservation of Swahili intangible heritage in Oman also ties into insights from feminist ocean studies and lingui linguistic anthropology. Here, expressions for the need to think about the Indian Ocean through a decolonial, multivocal, effective, and intersectional lens have recently grown, as evident, for example, in the book by Smiti Srinivas, Bettina Gueno, and Nilman J. Chandran, Reimagining Indian Ocean Worlds, in which the authors set out to look for, as they say, new units of analysis or keywords to shed light on this dynamic oceanic space and to push for an epistemic shift in thinking and writing about Indian Ocean worlds that centers conceptual theoretical relationality over area-based and geographical approaches. And the authors attempt this by emphasizing the importance of analyzing lives beyond the historical that is with a specific focus on, on the contemporary and the contemporaneous. Then, in their book, Signs of Difference, Language and Ideology in Social Life, from 2019, linguistic anthropologists Susan Gall and Judith Irvine emphasized that we need to ask how our people's ideas about languages, such as Omani Swahili speakers' language, uh, ideas about Swahili, ways of speaking and expressive styles shaped by their social positions and values. Statements about language, they argue, are never only about language but ultimately our actions, our social actions, embedded in history. Now, by taking these feminist and linguist pushes for an epistemic shift in thinking and writing about Indian Ocean worlds and Swahili as one of the languages and sociolinguistic practices that constitutes it, I want to turn to Mariam's notion of grandmother tongue as a potentially generative analytic device that can help us think more practice-oriented and intersectionally about Swahili Indian Ocean intangible heritage in Oman and the Gulf more broadly. For Mariam, speaking Swahili as her grandmother tongue, and I first want to focus on the notion of grandmother in the concept, ties into several other conversations I've had with young people in Oman and puts forward the significance of the ideas of generation and gender most strongly. As many of the second and third generations Swahili speaking Omanis I engaged with emphasized the critical relationships that ha uh, had enabled or constituted their own knowledge of Swahili were those not only to their parents or mothers, but rather to their grandparents and more specifically their grandmothers. In order to keep intergenerational dialogue with Swahili speaking family members alive, Knowing the language was and is inevitable, whether this may entail transoceanic or intra-Gulf conversation. The role of gender, as in the emphasis on grandmother and not father as agent of intangible heritage transmission and preservation, was equally prevalent throughout my conversations, with um, innumerable reiterations of it more commonly being second and third generation Swahili-speaking Omani women who considered themselves or were portrayed by their male peers as those people who continue to converse in Swahili, to teach Swahili to their own children, or to make sure there would be a Swahili speaking maid from East Africa present in the house to contribute to instilling language skills in the children. Fathers, such as Mariam's, were more frequently present as the Arabic speaking agents in the family. So there appears to be a particularly female agency and female kinship ties associated with, with Swahili intangible heritage conservation in Oman. Now, moving to the tongue in mother tongue and thinking again with Sohaila's statement about her relationship to speaking Swahili, what seems specifically striking here is the sense of orality and that of embodiment and affect. The declining loss of Swahili literacy and shift to the preservation of Swahili as an oral language only was backed up by many failed attempts I undertook to identify 
any existing formalized spaces of Swahili teaching or learning in and outside of Muscat. Regardless of whom I inquired about such spaces with, and despite Swahili being so widely spoken, I was only ever told that currently none such spaces existed and that the preservation of the language was confined to the private. A slow disappearance of Swahili regarding uh, reading and writing skills and the preservation of speaking only indicates that the form of Swahili is changing too and the Swahili intangible knowledge in Oman may slowly be transforming into an oral knowledge only. Finally, this domain of orality also implicates aspects of embodiment and affect as linked to Swahili intangible heritage in Oman. The oral apparatus is locus of affect, sensibility and preservation as the main tool of Swahili transmission and identification both enables the possibility to pronounce or to conceal in regard to negotiations of social positionality and perceive, uh, perceived external descriptions. So Swahili doesn't only seem to be shifting more to a sphere of the oral, but, is also, but also to exist importantly in the body and the affect, the affective states intertwined with it. So I would like to end with a set of research questions that draw on these concepts. Um, and that yeah, serve as a response to this existing, to the existing calls that, 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 that lament the loss and dissolution of Swahili, the endangerment of Swahili transoceanic dialogue, and that may tie into ideas of preserving and protecting the confluences of heritage and the many Swahili signs of different shapes and dimensions that constitute this oceanic space today. How can second and third generation Swahili speakers insights in Oman and in the Gulf and the intergenerational relationships that constitute and are constituted through language and kin diversify and challenge static ideologies of the Swahili as for example Sarah Hilbert has stressed as one ethno-linguistic group when the actual only sense of unity lies precisely in their claims to hybridity. How can gendered aspects of identity making that seem so crucial to Swahili speaking belonging in Oman be acknowledged more fully and reflect that oceans like the Indian Ocean indeed challenge and change feminist research, the sites and forms of uh, knowledge production, and not to mention the ground beneath your feet, as for example Gina Heathcote Irene Gedalov and Joanna Hoare argue in the introduction to their recent special issue of the Feminist Review on Oceans. And thereby, as May Joseph put it in her Indian Ocean ontology, be more inclusive of what she calls the forgotten, erased, and inaudible voices that otherwise fall out of the visible spaces of the vast, volatile histories of seafaring journeys. How can we think more fully with everyday Swahili language practice in the Gulf through the sphere of orality and at the interface between literacy and orality, as Kai Kresse and Clara Safirke put it recently? And with whom may responsibilities in protecting and preserving Swahili literacy lie and why? And then finally, can we also think with the embodied effective histories of present-day Swahili speakers in Oman, or what Mina Alexander has called with nervous knowledge, knowledge that you have through the nervous system lodged in the body, a performative knowledge, and acknowledge their influence on how Swahili-speaking people in Oman, and possibly the Gulf more broadly, are already currently trying to protect and preserve Swahili intangible heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Fay. Our next panelist is uh, Professor Shireen Mirza at Azim Premji University in India. 
The title of her presentation is Anti-Establishing Perspectives in Sufi Shia Religious Orders, A Genealogy of the Halal Khur and Dalit Muslim Identities in India. Professor Mirza. everyone for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I have a very simple PowerPoint uh, that I hope to persuade you with my material and my ideas. Um, so in this paper, I am going to be describing the transmission of ideas across the Indian Ocean. I'm looking at the Indian Ocean both historically and ethnograph ethnographically from an outlying area in Mumbai. Um, so this is uh, Shivajinagar Daiganwadi which is a landfill. It was built in 1899 by, um, by the uh, colonial sanitary state, uh, reclaiming waters of the Thane Creek. So it's water that was filled with land to build this, uh, this, this, this landfill. Uh, the colonial Bombay municipality planned to create a, a valuable uh, land by reclaiming this the creek waters, by removing the waste from the city of Bombay, of colonial Bombay, uh, by, cart, by carting the waste to these marshy peripheries in the aftermath of the bubonic plague, uh, plague of 1896. Uh, this is the oldest and the, um, the biggest landfill in Mumbai, surrounding which are slums, uh, which is known as Shahjinagar Beganwari, and I call them uh, a sea-facing neighborhoods because, as I put, as I want to show in this paper, um, because of the movement of antinomian figures, messianic traditions, as well as charity capital in the Indian Ocean that has built this neighborhood on both abstract religious cosmologies as well as on material foundations. Um, Mm, I have been doing uh, an ethnography of this landfill and the surrounding slums since 2011. And I've met, uh, at the landfill, I've met waste pickers who uh, collect waste in a gunny sacks um, over a period using a metal sickle, which in Marathi they call akri. And I've also mes met formal waste workers who are recruited in the solid waste management department in the municipality, in the landfill. And what's common between both the formal and informal waste workers is that they all seem to belong to formal untouchable castes, uh, now known as Dalit, for whom the work of sanitation is part of an ascribed caste identity. So the work of waste uh, is almost locked into caste, and it really follows very strict subdivisions such as uh, the Dalit subcaste of the Hindu Mang community, you will find them uh, working informally and accessing the, the landfill by themselves, uh, collecting and segregating waste. While on the other hand, the Dalit Mahar subcaste, uh, who following Ambedkar's conversion to Buddhism, converted from Hinduism to Buddhism, and as part of an Ambedkarite politics, are recruited as permanent or contract labor within the municipality. And uh, I think the larger number of people who work in the landfill are Dalit Muslims, uh, uh, also uh, from the Halal Khor caste from uh, Bihar and uh, Uttar Pradesh, who constitute the largest number of waste pickers in Deonar. Um, increasingly, there are also a lot of 12 uh, or she uh, uh, people who work in the landfill, and that's 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 a bit of a secret. And I and I only know because people kind of whisper to me about you know she also picks waste and so on. But largely, uh, sanit sanitizing and waste picking is is a profession uh, done by the formerly untouchable group. Uh, so it is from the perspective of these subaltern communities that I'm looking at the Indian Ocean. And I'm thinking of the Indian Ocean as a unifying and as a universalist space of religious interaction that has kind of uh, founded common cosmologies between these subaltern communities. So the, the Mang, the Matang community uh, that I spoke about, who believe in Bhakti saints, uh, which I will talk about as well, the Buddhist Mahar, the Dalit Muslims, the Halal Khors, and the Shis. Um, 
Now this sort of, you know, bringing together various religions under the umbrella of Dalit or stigmatized labor uh, kind of questions Indian sociological categories uh, which following a colonial nas nationalist genealogy of classifying Indian societies into distinct religious groups such as Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, um, this kind of gets questioned but when one thinks about, of caste as cutting across these religious orders, right, these, these established religious uh, institutions um, in which you, uh, Christians, Buddhists and Muslims are stigmatized in the same way as uh, for, for performing polluted labor, uh, labor as, uh, as, 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 Dalit, uh, as Dalit Hindus. And this belies uh, the idea of caste as, and religion as epistemolic, epist, epistemologically bifurcated uh, categories and as different realms. And uh, in the sense that caste is seen as something which is uh, internal to the nation and the politics, while the religious minority is as external to it. Exploring the Indian Ocean as a space of, universal, of a universalist ethos, as enabling a universalist religion, uh, enables me to think outside these disciplinary domains of caste and religion. Uh, you know, which, which I'm questioning this idea of a timeless uh, Islamic ideology, um, uh, which, which is spoken of through the loss of caste. So I'm trying to re bring caste back into, into, uh, into the way we talk about Islam in the Indian context. Um, I'm also of, of, uh, describing traveling traditions across the Indian Ocean that both transcend empires as well as lo uh, locally integrate, building cosmologies that create neighborhoods such as the one that you're seeing on your screen. So I'm looking at ways in which uh, interactions uh, in the Indian Ocean create uh, these slums of Shivaji Nagar Taigangwari along the landfill. My story about the Indian Ocean starts with the term Halal Khor. Now this is a term uh, that was picked up by the colonial Bombay municipality when it created the sanitary department and it termed the sanitary department as a halal khor department. It recruited uh, lower castes, uh, the, um, the castes that I spoke about, and where uh, the san sanitizing the city was seen as traditional caste labor referring to them officially as the halal cause. So the tax that was levied for municipal sanitary services of cleaning the city was termed the halal khor tax. And the term halal uh, translates as one who earns an honest living, or one who earns by the sweat of one's brow, uh, of, or one for whom all everything, all the rules, all food, including pork, and the leavings of others is lawful. And these are ideas I have, uh, I have traced uh, while talking to uh, other way speaking communities, the, uh, particularly the Hmong community, who often talk about uh, manual labor being the, being, being the only truth uh, or, or being, the, being the, own, the sole ethics of living in, the, in this world uh, uh, and the, the sole way in which, the, the true way, way in which value can be derived. Uh, questioning ways in which we, can, we construct uh, value through capitalist um, um, uh, ideas of value, right? So there's, there are these uh, sort of common ideas that I'm going to be sort of talking about in this paper. Um, there are multiple genealogies and origin stories of how Dalit Muslims or Lal Khors trace their community origins. Joel Lee, for instance, describes multiple origin stories that offer an ethics of care. Uh, and he speaks to, uh, to uh, Halal Khor Dalit Muslims who trace the idea of Halal Khor to the, the, per the first person I'm talking about in the Indian Ocean, that is Fazrullah Astarbadi, a messianic uh, saint from Astarbad in Iran who founded the, Hurufi, the Hurufia movement, the, the, movement uh, the science of letters. Uh, and I'll sp speak more about it. So, uh, Fazrullah Astarbadi, uh, who lived between 1339 and 1394, was the most influential messianic leader to emerge in Iran. And he was the first person who was given the title of Halal Khor, uh, because he was known for his uh, religious obligations, for his devotion to his, to his religious duties, and he earned the name Halal Khor, somebody who earns the most, through the most legitimate means, or who never takes a meal from another person. 
Um, the Harufi movement uh, seems to have come to India through, not directly through uh, Fazal Astar Badi. So Fazal Astar Badi never himself traveled to India, but the idea comes, the move, the messianic movement comes via another offshoot, uh, which is known as the Nukhtavi movement. Nukhtavi uh, comes from the Arabic word Nukhta or dot. Uh, founded by the followers of Fazlullah Asdarbadi, namely Mahmud Pasikani Jilani. And Pasikani was a disciple of Fazlullah Asdarbadi, and he was also known as the term Halal Khor, and was known as a man of piety, uh, known to be a good orator, and known to be somebody who depended on, on lawful earnings and was a student of Fazlullah Asdarbadi. The Nukhtavi, so it's very interesting, so the Nukhtavi movement actually comes to India uh, through during the reign of the uh, of, of Mughal Emperor Akbar, uh, and was sort of uh, the Nuktavi and the Harufi movement was seen as very instrumental in the formation of Akbar's courtly culture, where Nuktavi ideas of sun veneration, reincarnation, transmigration of the soul became central to uh, the tenets of Dine Ilahi, uh, which was the, the religion that Akbar founded. While Akbar and his courtiers were not strangers to uh, Iranian ideas, the arrival of Nuktavi figures reintroduced, rekindled, and elevated Iranian memory at the Mughal court in a new way and informed uh, a universalist ethos grounded in Islamic hermeneutics. And I'm thinking of the Indian Ocean as a space that allows for religious uh, movement through a, a universalist ethos. Um, so rejected in Iran, this ideology re was realized in India by feeding into the, uh, uh, the intellectual milieu that supported Akbar's religious reform. And there are mentions of the of Halal Khor in uh, N.A. Akbari, uh, documented by Abu Fazl, uh, which talks about royal stables and talks about uh, khak robes. Uh, and describes sweepers as being called halal khors. And uh, so the, the, the entry says that the world sovereign uh, Akbar brought this name into circulation. And by these accounts, Shah Abbas, the king, the Safavid king, uh, the, the seventh Safavid king of Imam of Iran, ordered a mass persecution in 1593 and threatened by anti-orthodox heretic, heretical positions and popularity of the Nuktavis, uh, he, he uh, ordered the persecutions. And in order to flee the persecution under the Safavid regime, the Nuktavis fled to India to escape persecution seeking refuge and patronage in Akbar's, uh, in Akbar's court. And it is uh, sort of this idea, the Nukhtavi ideas and the idea of Halal Khor that gets picked up uh, and, uh, and it, it gets uh, sort of uh, 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 put into the, 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 the colonial state, picks it up as, as referring to sanit sanitary labor and caste labor, right? Really? Okay. Um, so, so um, the Harufi and Nuktavi traditions, so just to give you a, a timeline, spread during the 10th and 11th century. To, uh, um, and so it, it travels from Iran, it gets popular, uh, um, it integrated into the Alabian Qatashi milieus in the Ottoman, and influenced the development of Azari and Ottoman Turkish literature. Um, so what I was, what I uh, sort of was really fascinated by when I did my research, uh, when I did my ethnography in the area of Shivaji Nagar Baiganwadi, is that some of these ideas of Hurufism and Nuktavi uh, seem to have strong parallels with uh, with Bhakti traditions uh, and with, with what the Matang community, uh, the cosm cosmologies they talked about, the idea of manual labor, or the Buddhist idea of the human as a manifestation of the divine. And uh, so there are these interesting connections that I'd like to share with you. Uh, this is from Javed and Nam uh, Namai Kabir, uh, which is an unpublished book uh, written by Fazlul Astar Badi. Uh, and there, these are excerpts, and I'll sort of, uh, you know, talk about, uh, read parts of it, uh, um, to just give you an idea, and, and then draw parallels to Buddhism and uh, Bhakti uh, traditions. So Nuktaviism believes that there's, there exists a hidden science to acquire which is at once the supreme duty and the supreme happiness of man, indicating and explaining the significance and meaning of all things in heaven, above and in earth, and the mystical correspondence which unite them. This hidden science is contained in the Quran. So the Quran and the letters of the Quran is seen as a certain kind of hermeneutics 
uh, that discloses the divine, uh, and uh, and its form is supposed to be a way of of connecting with the divine, and that the idea that man is created in the image of God in the best of forms. Um, so I'm going to skip some more. Uh, you see these ideas also in uh, Bhakti and Buddhist traditions of the monk and the Matam community. Uh, you also see ideas uh, of counter-establishment, of counter-religion. So the idea that paradise consists in knowledge and hell in ignorance. And so the, the Hurufi idea that uh, of, uh, of the 32 words being part of, uh, of all things and of paradise, which requires, which no longer requires prayers or fasting or cleanliness, and that everything is lawful. Right, so this is the idea of the, of the halal core, which questions established religion. And one finds par these parallels in Matang, both in Matang uh, cosmologies of Bhakti, uh, of Bhakti saints, who sort of invoke a, a, a line of heterodox Bhakti saints that begins with Nyaneshwar, Eknath, Namdev, Kabir, and ends with Tukaram in the 17th century. And, and, they sort of, and, these, and, and uh, the Ma uh, Matang cosmologies uh, describe stories of of these saints, uh, and these, uh, which, which describe ways in which each saint was, uh, was an outcast, was located outside of established religion and society, right? So, um, so there are these interesting par parallels of, so for instance, Saint Dhyaneshwar, Eknath, and referred to as uh, Maoli, which in Maratha, um, in Marathi, uh, 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 means I or mother, and uh, Mir Kasimov also talks about how or Hurufi and Javed Nama talks about the idea of motherly prophets and saints, right? And so these are very common ideas that uh, you know that I um, that I see uh, across uh, uh, Dalit monks, Matam, and uh, Dalit Muslims, um, and. Um, um, yeah. Um, the second set of movements uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, which has built the sea-facing uh, community, uh, the area of Shivajinagar, Daiganwadi, adjoining the Dionar landfill, is the establishment of the 12 Koja network along the Indian Ocean Rim, through which charity funds are given to migrant 12 shias from Bihar and UP in self-financing Shia neighborhoods around mosques and imambaras. Um, so. So, for instance, um, uh, in 1951, uh, the Nizar, uh, the Nizari Ismaili group, which split into two camps, uh, one rejecting Aga Khan's authority and, uh, and claiming it, and calling itself going back to a Khoja identity, and the second uh, uh, as claiming to be followers of Aga Khan, uh, these Khojas uh, who dissented um, and, and sort of filed a famous. A case called the Aga Khan case, broke away from the larger Ismaili community and sailed to East African coasts and settled there. While some of the Indians, uh, while some left the Indian shores seeking opportunities in trade and commerce, others left due to trials and tribulations and economic hardships and uh, faced on account of this breaking away from the larger Ismaili communities. Uh, the splinter group of the Khoja Isna Ashari in Bombay. Uh, sought new trade possibilities in the colonial, in the colonial context of Africa. Uh, and in 1882, the Jamaat of Zanzibar became the first ever Khoja Ashnari uh, Jamaat. In uh, 1897, a mosque, a cemetery, and a mambara was built in Lamu and in the port of Kenya. And uh, between 1946 and 61, these Jamaats were built. Uh, and um, and um, uh, 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 and in order to unite uh, these uh, Jamaats, the World Federation uh, was constituted in seven, 1976. And the World Federation, which is uh, which directs charity capital of the 12 Khoja community, uh, community, funds a lot of the uh, houses, uh, the Imambaras and mosques in Shivajinagar, Baiganwari, which was the area that I. Uh, I began this presentation with so, so, um, so, so this is sort of uh, you know. So I'm looking at uh, so just to conclude, right? Um, I'm thinking of the Indian Ocean uh, as um, a, 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 a having a universal ethos uh, or a space in between uh, that questions established 
orders, religious orders, that, 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 that transcends geographical borders, but also religious borders, which enables uh, cosmologies that are common to, uh, to, to Shia, Buddhist, and Bhakti traditions that have created a space, such as Shivaji Nagar uh, and Begunwadi, and created a common Dalit theology. Uh, through the idea of heretical saints such as Fazlullah, through the idea of antinomian figures uh, that question established uh, religious norms, religious orthodoxy, and the, and the Indian Ocean as enabling the idea of a universalist religion. Um, and through common ideas such as motherly saints, which counter religious authority. So I'm thinking of the Indian Ocean as a space of exchange of ideas that uh, that were that was possible away from established religion, religious, uh, political, and social orders. Thank you. Shireen, um, I hope I wasn't rushing you. Um, I'd like to invite um, Professor Anne Katrine Bang um, as a discussant for the panel to give her remarks and notes, and then we have time for a Q&A. So if you could just think of your questions, and we'll pass the mic for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, it is. Uh, it's an honor and it's a privilege to be able to comment on these four excellent papers. I hope Sulfikar is still with us. Or, uh, oh, I'll give the comments uh, to, for him and uh, Which is, of course, uh, much thanks to the speakers, but also to the organizers for putting together this excellent panel. I was thinking when I was well, my comments are also going to be a little bit uneven because I received the papers at a little bit different times. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking when thinking through it that this panel lies within the sort of intersection between uh, language and writing and identity, but also religion in a way, or the religious aspect of identity also. Uh, and we have in the panel, let me now go through it. We have been on the calligraphic coast. We have been the, in the occult ocean, uh, in the Swahili Sea, which is, uh, and what might be called the sea of the subaltern slash subversive even. Uh, I think that was the argument you were making. Uh, which I think is a, <laughs> It's a good way of thinking of the Indian Ocean overall to, to go by language and writing because we are what we are, how we speak and we are how we write. But I think the majority in this, lang in this room has more than one language and more than one register and also more than one script many of us have. So should I start with Sufika or, or not? Yeah. If he's hearing it, if not, it's a little bit yeah, I can, waste uh, of time. <laughs> uh, Professor Zalfikar, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Thanks. Great. So we'll put Thanks. you back up on the screen. Okay, great. Um, I'm glad you are here. Or I'm, I'm sorry that you are not here, Zalfikar, but I'm glad that you are uh, online. Thank you for your presentation. I, of course, as always, enjoy it a lot. And I'm learning a lot from, from your work. Uh, and I appreciate very much your comments uh, today regarding the pre-19th century, which is exactly what you are doing with the emphasis on the Siu Qurans. I had the pleasure of holding one of them in my hand in Siu in, uh, in March this year, which was amazing. Uh, I think you... The way that you are presenting it, I very much appreciate this drive towards 
development of a taxonomy or a sets of categories for, for the craft of manuscript production in East Africa, which I think is extremely important. And again, drawing the line or the chronology further back than the 19th century and even the 20th, where in fact the main corpus comes from. The one thing I was thinking about when, when listening to you now was, and it's something I, I have thought about before also, is to what extent these very, very sort of iconic uh, CEO Qurans constitute a benchmark for later manuscript production. I, I think that would be an interesting thing to study because I, I honestly don't know. I am not a trained codicologist, but it seems to me that there is some attempts at replicating later on, like late 19th century, but then with different uh, materials, different ink, different uh, everything. But I'm not sure. It was just a question that was left there. I was also a little bit left with the question of why not import uh, of Qurans, especially. Uh, I was just, that was just something that I was wondering about because in the later period you do see a lot of imported Qurans, especially from Oman, of course. Uh, yes, uh, for uh, Ahmed and the occult ocean, uh, it's wonderful that uh, somebody is uh, at last turning to the occult uh, in, uh, in uh, the Indian Ocean. It is something that is coming very much in Islamic studies in general, so it's about time and it's also absolutely necessary because without it we are incapable of understanding uh, the corpus that we're sitting with because it is anywhere between 10 and 20% of it uh, consists of uh, Rukia formula, astronomy, astrology, all of that. Uh, let me see your comments were a little bit before. Yeah, the, I, I appreciate that this is only a part of your work. And, and I really like framing practitioner or occult intellectuals of the occult, if you like, uh, as, uh, as public intellectuals. I, I think that's a very good situation. Uh, the one thing that is a little bit left out, and I, I understand that this is not the purpose of your argument here, but who are the public? To, to whom, uh, especially this enslaved person who, who is sometimes present, sometimes not, uh, unnamed, but he, he, I presume he, must also have had a public at some point. And, and that could lead to interesting arguments of are these converging publics or are they in fact distinct publics? Is one of them fully uh, scriptural, the other fully oral? Or is there a mix here somewhere? I, my suspicion is that there is, <laughs> if, you, if you go that way. And of course also to situate it in the broader Islamic tradition of uh, occult scholarship, which, which I know that you will do so. Uh, for Francisca, I know that you ended on a lot of questions, so <laughs> I wish I could say yes, 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 yes. But uh, <laughs> I, I think it's uh, totally fascinating the way you frame your research. I, I, I think it's uh, really the way to go. Uh, I am not a linguist, and, uh, nor are you, I think. So but I, I tended to think in terms of fields of activation, of where this more or less latent Swahili or capacity for using Swahili scripturally or orally is activated or not. Like in, well, you also said it, like in the in the family setting, in the male and female setting. Uh, I was thinking also leisure versus professionalism. Because, I mean, now I'm just picking from whatever I know about so-called uh, dying languages or minority languages. 
that they die because they don't have a language of professionalism. So they remain sort of ca casual home languages. I'm not sure if that is the way to go, but of course the case of Swahili is, uh, it isn't the case because that vocabulary is being developed all the time in Tanzania. So I'm, I'm not really sure where that would lead, but it would at least lead to the sort of disparity between the two of them. Uh, I was also thinking about one thing that you, this is only because of my own total fascination, but you alluded to but didn't uh, expand upon, and that is the use of uh, social media and messages, and especially voice messaging which uh, it's also something that I have experienced exactly this. I do my best to spell correctly Swahili, and then I get a voice message back. <laughs> so I'm like struggling to write correct Swahili. And then I get, uh, uh, so, and related to that also is the, the fourth, the, the, how to say, it? it would be probably the third, uh, point of the triangle, which is in fact English, and and well, the Swahili diaspora in English-speaking society, and how that plays into it. If if there is something to get there, because there are also the Swahili English-speaking grandmothers around too. I'm not sure. Of course, it the Arabic context is very very different from from the Canadian or any other, or, or UK. Um, finally, for Shireen, uh, I really appreciate the idea of the Indian Ocean as a, <laughs> I, I'm not completely sure that this was the argument you were making fully, but it's one that I really like, and that is as the Indian Ocean, as a place where the radically unorthodox can find a hideaway <laughs> and live. You know, that, that there, is a, there is a room somewhere for the all kinds of Bidah cult, all, all the weirdest same cult can find its home somewhere. Okay, it gets thrown out of Iran. But in, in this particular space, in Mumbai, it can live. And there is, uh, whether that makes it truly subaltern, or if it speaks more to the radical variety in which so-called universal religions exist in this world, I, I find it very, very fascinating. And, and the fact that this is not this is not a story about orthodoxy existing somewhere, and then sort of it, it has nothing to do with the syncretists, any of that tradition. It's more that these genealogies find a place to settle down and be practiced. And, and I, I think we should probably look for more of that. In, uh, in the Indian Ocean overall, in, instead of saying, oh look, there is the Minhaj Talibin also in Borneo, <laughs> but there are so many other things in Borneo, or uh, if you care to look. So I appreciate that very much. And yeah, I don't know if you want to answer first to the comments, then we take Q&As, or we still have, we still have 10 minutes. Questions first? Ooh, many hands. Uh, job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, best compliments, very much interesting. I would like to make uh, two questions. One to uh, our uh, young colleague and uh, his most interesting paper. I just was <clears throat> wondering if uh, 
the healing practices linked to the magical practices, especially in Zanzibar, have been uh, searched and published by an Italian author who is Lorenzo Deklic uh, many years ago. And he is an expert of Arabic language, so he explored the Zanzibari archives in the Arabic version. So I was asking myself if you're uh, planning within your PhD research studies to enlarge your research to the connections between astrology, religion, and magical practices within uh, the history of this island. And uh, for Francisca, uh, which is most interesting, I would like to ask you about the political role of the 1964 revolution in Zanzibar when you had many uh, people escaping from the island to uh, contribute to the construction of the modern Omani state and the role of the Swahili culture in this vice versa migration. <laughs> I don't want to make any difficulties, this is just curiosity. If you don't want to answer, nobody will. <laughs> okay, thank you. One, one or two more, and then we leave the final words to you. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. My question is uh, actually for you, Francisca. And I had a, I had a quick question, just in terms of um, this kind of this understanding of language, um, and sort of this is a, you know the grandmother Swahili. Firstly, you mentioned an accentless Arabic. I just wanted to clarify. Um, do you mean like an, an Omani dialect, or do you mean because what what does it mean to be without an accent, and in what context? Um, secondly, when it comes to the attempts that your um, that your friend and interlocutor in this instance uh, had made when it came to attempting to speak Swahili and was insulted, then is it really a grandmother's Swahili, or is it an attempt to connect to others um, within their own generation uh, to engage in Swahili language and culture? And how does that relate to the visibility of the influence of Swahili culture and language within society and within other types of cultural production? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I will make my question short. I really enjoy all these presentations. And my interest is especially to Professor Shrin's. Really glad you did this detailed work with Persian literature. And my question is that this term, Halal Hur, was adopted by the municipality first. But then, uh, how did the Dalit Muslim and other low caste Muslim lead? interpret and enrich the cosmology of Harufi with their contact with their social condition because it seems this is from uh, upside down but they how could they enrich this from from below or from grassroots? It is my question. Thank you very much. Oh you want go on. Uh, thanks. I'll try to be as quick as possible. First of all, I, I think the point that Anne uh, mentioned about the, the uh, importance of the hidden, the unseen, uh, the invisible in thinking and rethinking about Indian Ocean mobilities, immobilities, I think that's fascinating. Uh, my uh, question is to Zulfikar. When he used the word the calligraphic cost, I uh, immediately uh, remembered uh, Brinkley Messick's book, The Calligraphic State. And there, uh, you know, the manuscript culture writing is very much tied to state authority. But I felt that what was going on in the Indian Ocean was something different. So if you could elaborate the specific ways in which the calligraphic 
uh, the, the, how it manifests itself differently, I hope, <laughs> from the territorial imperial uh, frameworks uh, as such. I have other questions, but I need to stop. <laughs> okay, well, one more question, and then we have been given 10 more minutes for the panelists to respond. Okay, thank you so much for very wonderful presentations. My question is one that I want, if you can, address it the three of you, which is, I hear a shadow of Africa in this presentation, whereby how does your work, for example, the agrarian question, environmental history, debates in African studies can relate to the Indian Ocean debate? Because we're thinking of the Indian Ocean and its studies as a crossroad and as a site of exchange, whereby it also could or may not, but to engage it, whether it crossroad, this crossroad actually exists. For example, in the debate, like you were saying, public intellectuals, so do you want to attach it to humanisms or those public intellectual debate in the African studies? Is there a way that we can have those type of conversation in the feminist orality, all of that, you know, like, or do we want to shy away and do we have an epistemological reason to do so if we're, if we're interested to do so? This under the shadow of Africa, I mean, that's what is beyond Lemo and this islands. Do we have an intellectual conversation? Is a broader conversation which is happening in African studies, which you could see be, be bridging. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to let uh, Sofikar speak first, since he is uh, sitting there uh, in the cold, uh, cold Canada <laughs> on Zoom. No, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll just respond to the two, uh, two questions that I can respond to. The first one was yours about whether or not we see um, later uh, examples of um, the manuscripts from the 17th, 18th, 18th year being sort of used. I've only seen one example, it's in the Rialdo's collection that you uh, assisted in having digitized. Where I, which I've heard at the moment left out of the court, out of the court was because it's, it, it seems to be exactly what you've just described, what you've described, which is um, an attempt to uh, replicate uh, visually the, uh, the sort of earlier corpus, corpus, the manuscripts of the corpus. Um, so that's one example. The other example that I have um, of copying is uh, we have a manuscript, uh, it's not on the Swahili, it can be. Well, Marika, which is the uh, story of Heraclitus, which is uh, which is uh, written in Swahili in Arabic script, um, which was copied by Muhammad Bijoma, and in there we have visual, direct visual copying borrowing going on from um, the manuscript that currently is housed in the Fowler Museum in Los Angeles. So I think that there are uh, the, the 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 later uh, copies um, uh, and, and the manuscript producers may have referred, possibly did refer directly to those earlier examples, or that those early examples were so well known to them that they visually were able to replicate them from, from, from just having, you know, having a general knowledge of them. I'm not really sure what, which, which it is, but there certainly are examples. Um, to those two examples, I, I, I think, exist. Um, in terms of the idea of the telegraphic coast, uh, you know, I, of course, I, I know uh, Frank's work well, and, um, and I, I'm, you know, fascinated by his ideas that have been for, for, for a long time. Uh, I, when I think about, when I was thinking about this idea of the telegraphic coast, it kind of just popped into my head. I assumed that it probably has some, some, you know, recall, you know, unconscious recall of Frank Frank's ideas. But I think that one of the things that was really interesting to me about thinking about the telegraphic was to think about the idea of movement in the writing of calligraphy. Um, and to say, um, and that's not just Arabic calligraphy, but that's all forms of calligraphy. And so I wanted to kind of tie this idea of movement uh, to the, you know, the this that's a logical term. Having said that, I think that is the question, I think the question you've asked is, is, is a brilliant one, a really important one we're thinking about. I'm just starting to think about this idea of the calligraphic coast. It isn't fully formed, and it's really the first time I've uttered it out loud is in this, in this paper today. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it works well. I think I wanted to move it beyond a metaphor and really think about it and, and hope it emerges in sort of in a grounded way from the um, historical material I'm looking at. Um, so, if people do think it has potential, then please let me know if you think it's an absolute, you know, 
silly idea, and also please, please let me know. But um, yeah, just to wrap it up, I think that Greg's work does actually provide the, the way to think about it. And I do think you're right that it may actually have much more uh, this idea of a kind of a, a differentiated understanding of law sort of state orientation might be much, much more productive for the for the region that we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophika. Now I'm going to let uh, the three uh, panelists respond. In any order you prefer. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Bank, for your uh, feedback. I do like the call to action. I might steal that from you. Uh, regarding the public, do you mean the public that the author is addressing or the public that the enslaved person is interacting with? No, I mean both. Like users, readers, yeah. uh, patients, if it's a healing. Uh, yeah. yeah. So in terms of the author, so Nasser um, always refers back to Oman, saying we have such and such tree in Oman, it resembles the way we Omanis use it. Um, so it's clear that he's talking to Omanis in his text, right? By referring to Oman and Omanis all the time. Although the sources that he's drawing from ranges from Somalis, Ethiopians, and slave East Africans from the Swahili coast, but also the mainland, and he's explicit with these citations. Uh, regarding the enslaved individuals, it's really hard to discern who are the publics here, but we have a sense from his citations is that these individuals were actually sought after to learn from their you know, spells and formulas how to perform certain uh, you know, uh, occult works uh, in the environment, uh, including plants uh, or spirits. Um, and from European sources, we have a better sense that such, uh, let's say, uh, public intellectuals do have popularity in the Zanzibari society. Um, so they do stand out because they were seeked and they were documented and they were valued for what they know. Uh, that's how I think of the public. Um, regarding uh, the work that you mentioned, yes, he describes Omani manuscripts in the, in the archives. But I haven't seen him writing on this, so thank you, I will, I will look it up. Um, regarding Africa, African studies, well, part of what I'm doing is to start a conversation between desperate, distinct fields. Environmental historians don't read Swahili Arabic sources. Africans don't read these texts, assuming Swahili society to be primarily oral, lacking textual sources. Um, on the other hand, Islamic studies folks don't really engage in uh, African studies and think about African oral history and orality in that sense. Um, traditionally speaking, now things are changing during the last uh, two decades, I would say. So I'm trying to bring all of these fields together and thinking about such a source, which is very generative in thinking about it. Because Nasser, in addition to writing about the occult, he also has a book in which he introduces Swahili language to Omanis and saying this is how Swahili should be written and this is a, are the Swahili meanings of these terminologies. Therefore, there is an active investment in learning and documenting Africa during the 19th century by many Europeans. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to highlight. Thank you, um, and thank you everybody for the really thought-provoking uh, feedback. I'm so glad you bring up English because and this is why I try to talk about the diasporic spectrum because it's of course also a linguistic spectrum and it's not only Swahili but we always have these terms or concepts that then exist with within like fields or clouds of association that also include English and it was particularly English with the younger women between 25 to 40 I was speaking to who kept mentioning that particularly an English language private school education had allowed them to today be very proud and owning up to having also a Swahili identity as part of their Omani identity. And this precisely being possible in English and not so much in Arabic because it was more quickly critiqued or shut down often as well in Arabic. So it was this English language realm that allows more ownership over an integrated or what may be politically called subnational, like the sense of belonging that is more inclusive and more broad than um, yeah, other ideas of citizenship.
change that may be. Um, the, the revolution, of course, I can't speak to the revolution, but people speak to the revolution, and young people speak to the revolution consistently, and it's the second and third generation young communities of memory who now, after their parents, are talking about it, and who are seeking or who are reactivating or hoping to reactivate or keep, preserve this link to their grandparents' generation, who are the sources of knowledge and who are getting lost. And so this historical sense of facing moments that have not so much been processed often, particularly in the public, is again so closely linked to this accessibility through language, through this intergenerational dialogue. So this is all I, I guess I can say to that. Um, accent, in terms of not having any accent when speaking Arabic that would identify you as an outsider or as having any other subnational sense of belonging, but that would make you appear as pure, and pure being a term that is then so often used self-descriptively. Um, in terms of, is it a grandmother tongue? I'm not sure I understood you right, but let's chat about it later because I'd love to um, hear more about how you understood it. And broader conversation with African studies, I think we need to look outside any kind of studies. I think we need to look to the arts, I think we need to look to aesthetic spaces, to non-scholarly productions, such as literature, such as contemporary art. I was, like, I've been recently really engaged with the work of uh, Le Bene Hamid, Sainsbury British Turner Prize winning artist whose contemporary paintings really address notions of feminist knowledge production in relation to the sea. These are sources that are so valuable for changing um, the reproduction of particular ideologies about these things that we consider Indian Ocean or whatever we want to call it. So I think it's looking outside of these really hard to change fields to, to build other fields. Yeah, um, thank you. I mean, I um, skipped a very large part of my paper uh, and I'm just so happy that you uh, actually got my argument about the Indian Ocean being a radically unorthodox space, simply because um, uh, the larger religious orthodoxies in, in the regions have suppressed uh, these uh, messianic traditions, uh, heretical cults, or uh, these antinomian saints, uh, and banished them, right? So they exist uh, because of the Indian Ocean, and they perhaps find home, as, as you so nicely put it, in a place uh, like the landfill, which really exists uh, because, but also uh, outside of normal, of, it exists because of capitalism, but also outside of it, being a space uh, which recycles waste, right? Um, and um, so the other point you made, is it about subaltern or radical variety? Um, I would go with, a, with, with, with formulating it as a radical, um, radical forms of, uh, radical cosmologies and foundations, right, that actually are uh, built spaces. We often think of places as being made through material realities. We never think of radical cosmologies as actually helping us make space. Um, so much, uh, because uh, the subaltern is tied to larger power structures, right, so the radical is something which is um, counter to the orthodox, counter to establishment, uh, and not, in, not, not necessarily in an anti-establishment way, but in a counter-establishment way, which is sort of, you know, creating its own universe, its own geographies, um, of uh, its own cosmologies, uh, and perhaps not really interested in established religion, because it's not even looking to overthrow it or change it, because it knows it's never going to be accepted, it's always going to be shunned and banished persecuted, right? Um, to your question about uh, the Halal or uh, you know, it was taken up by the colonial state, but uh, did it exist as a grassroots identity? I think it's the other way around. I think it was the colonial state that actually picked up uh, uh, a local identity uh, and just saw it as, uh, you know, uh, as, 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 uh, as 
traditional caste labor. So cleaning was something that had to be done through, uh, through, through caste labor as it existed. And so therefore, the, 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 all the work of sanitation, the language, and the naming of it takes on a traditional tone. It's, it's almost like the othering of the dirt, right? And, uh, and I'm recalling Mary Douglas and so on, right? Um, and so that's the way I would say. I would say that uh, as an identity exists as a caste identity, exists as a grassroots identity, which gets kind of just taken up by the colonial state and just put in there. Uh, and, but when it's a very, I mean, uh, because it, 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 I, I found it in the archives, I actually go and look for a genealogy, which led me to Fazil Astarbari, which led me to these crazy Nuktahogis. And then, um, and I think where I really missed my presentation was the connection between the Hurufis, the Nuktavis, and the Ismailis. Uh, and then, it, which goes back to, uh, to Africa and, and kind of, all of which finds a home in this slum, <laughs> right? So, yeah, thank you. I hope I didn't miss any other questions. <coughs> Well, uh, thank you very much. This concludes uh, the second panel of the day. We will now break for coffee. I just want to thank all the panelists uh, for all the contributions. We, we will reconvene in half an hour for a visual presentation or performance by uh, Naiza Khan titled The Ocean as Archive. Thank you very much.